We would like to thank you for joining us for another episode of Looking to Jesus. My name is John Hines. I am joined by Daniel Sanders. Daniel, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing all right. We have been going through the seven churches of Asia mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3, and we are wrapping that study up today. Yes, we are. So we're going to be looking at the church of Laodicea. And uh, this is this is one of the more well-known churches. I, I think just to use that figure of lukewarmness, a lot of folks have heard of it. And um, it, it was one of the more well-known ones historically. Uh, you want to read the passage for us, Daniel, please? Sure will. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 down to verse 22. It reads here to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. These sayings says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I can wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Appreciate that reading. And Laodicea, very well known um, through excavations, um, the work that's been done over there. And it was a very well known city. Some of the cities, I can't remember, do you remember which one it was that some of the historically was like, yeah, nobody cares about that city? <laughs> can't remember would, which one it was. That would have been, uh, what was that, Thyatira? It was the one that was right there. No, it was a, a Pergamum. Okay. For sure, it's Pergamum. It was the one that was just kind of a, here it is, beat yeah. this city up first before you go and touch any of the other cities. Sort yeah, of thing. pretty much. Um, and I mean, there there was a, a city there, but it was just not well respected, didn't have a good reputation, or, or at least not a strong reputation. Laodicea, it is. it was well known. There's not a city there now, um, but it was extremely well known at that point. Some of the, some of the things... And and we've made the point through each one of these churches that the images and the language that the Lord uses had an application and the recipients of the letters would have understood the figures, that there were things historically, geographically, that would have clearly stood out to them as the Lord is making spiritual applications. So some of the things about Laodicea, and actually there's several things that as we go through these details of the city, we'll, we'll see how they, how the Lord uses the figures. So the city was wealthy. It, it was extremely wealthy. It was, a, it was the banking center of the area. And it was so wealthy that there was an earthquake there. This whole region Daniel, do you remember in the previous studies, there was an earthquake? There was that... an earthquake in, in uh, uh, Philadelphia, not Philadelphia, in our 
chapter three there. Um, sorry. Yes. Do you remember what year it was? When it like seven seventeen? Okay. There. So there was an earthquake in seventeen. There was another earthquake in sixty A.D. in the area. And obviously, the area it's like it's prone to earthquakes. Um, yeah. There's fault lines all over the place, and it it devastated Laodicea. And one of the things that Rome would do, and the emperor of Rome, they would offer to help these cities rebuild. And that's what that's what happened. And a lot of the most of the cities, most of the cities took that aid. Yeah. But not Laodicea. Laodicea said, we can do this on our own and we will do this on our own. And they did not take the help. That's how wealthy they were. So when the Lord talks about, so when the Lord says they were wealthy, they were saying, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. That was the very thing they said to the emperor of Rome. They said, we're wealthy. We don't need your help. And that same mindset, that was how they were thinking about the Lord, frankly. Yeah. They were, they were trusting in their riches that they were good. And that, that was the situation. Laodicea, one of the other things to know about it was it was on the major thoroughfare to the churches of Asia uh, or to the cities of Asia, I should say, and the Middle East. If you're going to get, if you're going to get from Asia or Israel, the Middle East, if you're going to get from that area to Ephesus, you got to go through Laodicea. If you're going to go west or north, the road comes into Laodicea and it spreads from there. And so when the Lord talks about, I stand at the door, they were basically the door to all of those cities. All the, uh, all the affluence came through there. They yeah. were the gateway. Um, so it's located in a prime position. And, and this is just... And what I would encourage folks to do, what I would encourage our listeners to do is to think about the passage as we go through these. It's like, oh, the Lord's using figures they understood. Laodicea, it was located in a prime position intentionally because of commerce. But the problem they had was they did not have a good water source. They, they just didn't. So what they had to do was to bring water from another city via aqueduct. And that's how they got their water. They have some of that piping that they've excavated. And you can tell the water that was likely coming from another city we'll mention here in a second. By the time it got to, and, and it, was, it was filled with minerals and not good minerals. It was coming from... Daniel, how do you pronounce the city? Two of the cities that are mentioned in scripture, uh, one of the cities that was nearby was Colossi, Colossi. But the other one was, is it Hier Hierapolis? Hierop Hierapolis. Hierapolis. And let's, let's go ahead and talk about those cities. Because you have this figure of, by the time the water got to Laodicea, it was tepid because it was coming... It was coming a number of miles by aqueduct. And most people think it was coming from Hierapolis. And Hierapolis, which was one of the neighboring cities, was known for its hot springs. And you would have, and you people, people can research this online. They know all about it. These hot springs were just filled with all sorts of minerals that were very good for, you know, it's like a therapeutic hot tub effectively mm -hmm. and so it would have all sorts of minerals in it that was wonderful to soak in and to bathe in but it was horrible to drink <laughs> yeah you don't want to drink this water but that's right. where they're getting their water from they thought oh well if it's good enough for hierapolis it's good enough for us and so it would start off steaming hot in hierapolis and by the time it got to laodicea it was tepid and lukewarm which did nothing for the taste at all, and it would it would make you it would make you gag to drink right. it, and if you cooked with it, 
people talk about how it would just, if you cooked with it, it would make your whole house smell like, frankly, sulfur. Yeah. And it was just, it was disgusting. Natural, natural, yeah, natural with that hot water, yeah. Yeah. So that was one of the neighboring cities, Hierapolis. One of the other neighboring cities, Colossi, their water source came from the mountains. And, you know, even in this country, you know, people talk about the water that comes from the Rockies and stuff like that. Well, that's that's what Colossi had. They had water from the mountains, and so it was cold, it was fresh, and it was refreshing. And so you had these two neighboring cities that had very good water for different purposes. One was cold and refreshing, and one was hot and therapeutic. Daniel, I'm not letting you say much. I apologize. No, you're fine so far. But in my notes, th this sounds like a tried analogy. But I was thinking about like those those icy hot patches. Yeah. You know, and you have cold. It's like when you sprain your ankle. There are times where you need cold and there are times where you need hot. Exactly. What you don't need is lukewarm. No, it does nothing. It's It serves no purpose when right. we talk about the idea of being lukewarm, where it, you know, it, 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 you don't you, you you can't use it for any type of thing i mean it's just, it's just there right it's just it, it's just there yeah uh so on a on a medical side when you think about it or on a useful side in with water it's just you you need therapy you gotta have hot uh you need to have cold uh for different things just like what you mentioned and when you're lukewarm you gotta you either gotta make it one or the other uh, right. every time you do that when your when your ice pack or whatever it is becomes warm, you got to put it back in the freezer to be able to make it cold again. If your heating pad becomes, you know, lukewarm, you got to put it back in the microwave or right. however you do to heat it back up. There's just no purpose behind it. Uh, and Jesus offers, I mean, it's not pleasant. It's not right. pleasant how Jesus how Jesus describes right. this. I, yeah, it's, I, pretty, I also, it's a pretty strong rebuke. I, I think about I think about it also in this way, you know. I, I like cheese sandwich. Some sandwiches you can get a nice cold piece of cheese and it's good. Then you get hot cheese. I'm thinking more about the hot side of everything. Hot cheese dip. Mex you know, go to the Mexican restaurant, get the white cheese dip. It's great when it's hot. It's not palatable when it gets lukewarm. I, I for me. You get to that point where it just becomes one congealed glob of goo, yeah. Where it's not liquidy anymore, and you just got this ball of whatever you want to call it or however you want to describe it, right? And it's just like it's like you try to you try to eat that, and then, you know, almost all the time I sit there and just stick my tongue out, just meh, just comes yeah. out. It's just it's just not palatable in any type of way, right? And you know, I think about you know things like lukewarm like that. It's just it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant for the taste. It's not pleasant, uh, you know, just for the texture of everything as well. It's just not useful. Yeah. In and this case. I, I think if, if we don't understand the, the geography of Laodicea, we may, we may make the wrong application to, to something that Jesus says. We'll talk about that when we start looking at the verses individually. Yeah. But this, was, this is what Laodicea was like. It, it's a figure they understood when the Lord says, you're tepid, just like your water. Yeah. And you just you just make me want to puke. Yeah. And um it's a figure they understood very, very well. The other thing, Laodicea, one of the other things, actually, there's a couple other things that are known for. One was its textiles. They had a certain breed of sheep that was raised nearby that was known for its black wool. It, people talk about its glossy black wool. And they were shipping that fabric throughout the Roman Empire. And so when the Lord talks about buy from me and, you know, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, uh, that your nakedness may not be revealed. They thought they were clothed immaculately. And it's like, no, in the Lord's eyes, they were naked. Yeah. Um, one of the other things they were known for and this is the last one I have on my list. And just see all of this history and, and geography plays into what the Lord says. 
they had a world renowned medical school there. And one of the things that, again, they exported all over the Roman Empire was an eye salve. And that's what they were known for. They had an eye salve and they had a foot salve, but they were more well, well known for the eye salve. And so when the Lord talks about and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see, they thought they thought they could see things clearly. Right. Spiritually speaking, they thought they were. And it's just like the Pharisees in Jesus time. They thought they could see. And they didn't realize, like, no, you're blind as a bat. You, you can't see that you're naked. It's like the emperor's new clothes. You, you know, you can't see just how destitute you were. So he tells them what he says, trying to get them to wake up. And like you said, it's a strong rebuke. It's bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this one, you know, the, the, the rebuke is just, it's just not, ple you know, I mean, any rebuke is not pleasant, but right. it was well needed. Right. With everything for them to be able to, you know, no pun intended, open their eyes. Yeah. So all, all of those things from their wealth to their water, to their textiles, to their eye salve they were shipping out. And now we start looking at it verse by verse. So to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, these things says the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Um, amen. Isn't that the word that's translated? Is it in the King James where it's verily? I'm not saying necessarily in this passage, but the word. Oh, I'm thinking when um when yeah, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says, Verily, verily I say unto you. And that word there is literally amen and amen. Okay. And and it's like, this is the truth, guys. <laughs> And it's the truth because Jesus is the truth. Yeah. Um, which basketball player was it that had the nickname the truth? Wasn't that Iverson? No, it was Paul Pierce. I was going to say, it's Paul, I thought it was Paul Pierce. Sorry. Yeah, the Paul truth. Pierce. Yeah. yeah, Alan Iverson. I have been the answer. I don't remember. Was anyway, wit sorry. Was, tangent. He wit was he the witness? Distract. I'm distracted. Sorry. <laughs> it's like the truth. Jesus is the truth. And he is the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I don't know if you had anything in your notes about, or, or do you have any thoughts on the beginning of the creation of God? Because some people, some people do teach that Jesus was created. Yeah, I don't, I, well, I don't know how they come, come about that. I mean, there's a lot of other verses that deal with that specifically. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't really know, uh, you know, put me under the bus again, but <laughs> sorry. One, one, of the com one of the commentators makes the point to look at the language rather than him being the first thing created. We know how, wherever it is, is it Colossians or elsewhere? All things were created through him. And nothing was made that was made. Yeah. And yeah. that it's not that he's the first creation. It's that. Yeah creation starts with him and that he is the creator that's one that's one people's take on it another take and i i probably lean more this way you know for in thinking about it, says that he's the firstborn of the resurrection elsewhere and that he was so in that sense he's the beginning of the creation of god namely he is the first He's the firstborn of the resurrection, that the resurrection began with him when he came from the tomb. Anyway, uh, e either way you slice it, obviously we're, in, we're, we're picturing Jesus, that yeah. he's the truth, he's faithful, the witness, might think about testimony, things like that. Uh, John, John 1, 3, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. All right, so it talks about the, the water source. Um, so what is he saying here, Daniel? <laughs> and I think we, we've already said it. Yeah. He, he wishes that there was some sort of distinction. Because as we, as we look at this, 
Uh, I also want to point out because we get into verse 15 and 16. There's no, uh, there's, there's no, Hey, this, you're doing this right. We don't get that here. Yeah. You know, that there, this is something that's a little bit different compared to the majority of the rest of the churches where he points out something, something positive of some sort at one point. Most I mean, of them, even, I, I, in, love, even in the dead church, there are those was, who had not defiled themselves. Yeah. I was getting, I was getting ready. I just want to get back up here again. Uh, you know, he says, be watchful and strengthen things which remain that are ready to die. Speak about Sardis. Yeah. I found your works not perfect for it. I mean, there, there was something positive, even if it was in the slightest. Right. And then verse four, he goes on to say, you know, the few garments that are, have not yeah. he gets into this one and says, I know your works are neither cold nor hot. He wants them to be able to say, I want you to either let your yes be yes or your no be no sort of thing. You need to be able to uh, show your works in that you're either you're either a sinner that needs to repent or you're someone that is, you know, a faithful and zealot Christian. You need, you know, are you are you somebody like that church in Philadelphia? Or are you that church that's up the road from Philadelphia like Sardis? I wish I, you were one of the two. And I I take a little different view on this one. Okay. And this is where because the you, for example, the the water from Colossi, the the cold water from Colossi was good, right? Yeah, yeah. The hot water in Hierapolis was good. The question is: Is Jesus saying? And he does say this in other places, by the way. Hold on, let me look up something. He does say. Let me get my brain to work. Oh, hold on, Daniel. Okay. Look over in chapter 22 of verse 11. 22 or 20? 22. Over in chapter 22 at verse 11, he says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Uh, that's an interesting passage. <laughs> um, yeah. Because the question is, you know, the concept of let he who is filthy be filthy still. Does Jesus really want anyone to be filthy? No. And, and so no. It, it it speaks to this issue is, and so that's why I say he does, obviously in chapter 22, verse 11, that's what he's saying. And it's like, choose one or the other, like Joshua at the end of his life. Choose for yourselves this day whom you're going to serve. Are you going to serve God or are you going to serve the pagans? Pick one, one or the other. That concept is found in scripture. My my question is, is that what he's saying in Revelation 3? Is he saying pick good or pick evil? Or is he saying either be cold and refreshing like Colossae or be hot and therapeutic like Hierapolis. Either one was good. Either one was good. And that there were times in Jesus's ministry, like when he cleanses the temple and it's zeal for thy house is eating me up. And he's kind of going, it's like hardcore. It's like zeal. I think in zeal, the word that literally means hot. Can't remember. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. It does. seems like it. it, it there, yeah, a, far, a root of that is is hot. Fire. And it's like, and it's like he's you know filled filled with zeal. Other times, where uh, other times he is, let, let's put it this way: on some people he has compassion, or on other people he does not. You know, like when you get up to Matthew twenty three and the woes, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And he starts going scorched earth. And, but then other times, like the woman caught in adultery, and he says, Neither do I condemn you. And I wonder if what the Lord is saying in Revelation 3, it's like there, there are times to be absolutely scalding hot. <laughs> yeah. And there are other times to be absolutely cold and refreshing. And both are good. Both are good. And both are necessary. There's a time for both. There's a time for everything under the sun. Time, you know, time for all, season for everything. 
what we don't need is just meh. <laughs> yeah. That's what we don't need. We don't need meh. It's like be be cold, be hot. I, is he saying that the cold is bad? That that's the question. That's the issue. And, and anyway, just like I said, that passage in chapter 22 where he's making that point. The let those who are filthy be filthy still. Let those who are holy be holy still. But here in Revelation 3, that's that's my hot take on it. Feel free to say, John, you're an idiot. No, I mean, I can see where you're coming from. I, I think I, I, I take it as well, just kind of like with what I was, you know, my, my point of view from it. You did not was, take advantage of me saying you could call me an idiot. I'm not going to call you an idiot because you do that. You, you do that to me off the camera plenty. <laughs> uh, I believe you have your pronouns wrong in that sense. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> um, way I take it as well, because he does not offer any type of good. Yeah. You know, he just gets he just gets into it. Oh yeah. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't offer praise. Uh, so I'm looking at it, you know, I'm looking at it from that perspective. Yeah. Of, and either way you cut it, the result, frankly, is the same. It's lukewarm it's a, is bad. Yes. Yeah. Either, either way, way, either way, either, either way you come from that, whether if you're looking at it right. from the historical side or you're looking at it from, uh, fr from, you know, the side of, you know, there's no correction or anything. We get to the same conclusion on this. Yeah. And I think that that's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. To have to have that uh, right. difference on this, because lukewarmness, Jesus lukewarmness. said, "I'm going to vomit you out." Yeah, it's not pleasant. You cannot it serve two no, masters. You can't. You cannot it. serve two masters. You cannot be. You know, you, your therapy or your drinkability with water. It's not the same when it's when it's tepid, when it's lukewarm, when it's just right there. Yeah, you know, if you're trying to do therapy. And we have a, uh, you know, uh, we have a rec center just up the road from us. And we have a therapy pool. Yeah. And if, you know, it's, you go in it, it's hot. It, right. It, it's hot and it kind of helps relax the muscles and everything. But eventually it does kind of cool off a little bit. And you got to kind of move out of there and move into something else to be able to kind of rejuvenate your body, re rejuvenate, go back into the therapy pool at a different point. It serves a purpose, but if it's lukewarm, it's not going to do anything. Yep. It's not going to be pleasant in any type of way. And I think verse 17 shows like, okay, what was it that was making them lukewarm? Yeah. The self-sufficiency of everything. Right. Of because themselves. you say I'm, I'm rich. I become wealthy. I don't need anything. Yeah. And they didn't realize they were, they were wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Yeah, they were completely vulnerable with their spiritual life, separated from God because of this. You, you it's know, the, the, it's the idea. It's the idea of when you know there's a time for everything. Uh, you know, in our life, unfortunately, this is the unfortunate things that we look at when we look at that first part. If everything's going our way in life, what what sometimes gets left out? Yeah. That's God. Right. I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I've got everything I need in this life. I don't need anything else versus the poor man that's over there. You know, if they were poor, wretched, understand they were poor, wretched, miserable, naked, blind, they turn to God. They have a tendency to turn to God more from time to time. I'm not saying that's always the case, but unfortunately, the the trend kind of leans the same way with what Leos was doing there. Yeah. I'm wealthy and I don't, and I've got everything I need. I don't need anything else. I don't need God. I'm doing this all on my own. And that's the failure of everything. It's like the foolish farmer. I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to right. bring them and I'm going to build more. That way I can be able to sit back and eat and drink and be merry. And I can be able to, I've got everything I need. And what does it say there? Fool, your soul is required of you tonight. You have not been rich towards God. Sorry, I went on a little tan, my own little soapbox here today. No, you're all right. Do you, do you think that's one reason the Lord allows us to go through trials, like the like Paul's thorn in the flesh, where you have this messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. He prays three times that it be removed. We know what the Lord's answer was. My grace is sufficient. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, no, you you need to learn to lean on the Lord when yeah. when he says to the Philippians, I. I can do, you know, the, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
the context of that is I have learned how to be abased. I have learned how to abound. And like he had to learn those things. Right. And the way you learn those things is by going through trials. So here, here the Laodiceans were. And it's just like Israel of old. When they had times of great prosperity, who did they turn away from? God. Turned away from God. Again, following the, following the unfortunate trend of everything that we see today. Yeah. We see that today. I've got things going my way. I turn away from God. Right. Things, things become a little more tumultuous, a little more chaotic. Maybe we will turn back to God more. It shouldn't be that way. We should be able to be rich towards God. You know, take what God has blessed us with. You know, like how Job did. Lord right. is blessed. Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of it. In right. all aspects. In all aspects. And I think G Jesus addresses that with the um, rich young ruler. Yeah. When the rich young ruler leaves and Jesus talks about how hard it was for the rich to enter into heaven. Right. And he says, now the things that are impossible with man are possible with God. That it is possible with God to be rich and to be rich in good works. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> you better be with God. And the um, sad thing is it, it's, it, it's usually, it's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. That's right. I, I, wanted, I wanted to share a, a little tidbit, and I don't hear many folks talking about this, concerning the love of money, which is obviously the issue in Laodicea that is causing their lukewarmness and it involves the number 666 and that number that is mentioned over in chapter 13 and let me flip over there and no we're not getting ready to start a tangent this ties in in revelation chapter 13 you can see how the number 666 is tied in with the economy if you will this is verse 16 he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Daniel, we, you know, these congregations we've been looking at, they were facing economic persecution, right? Yeah, some some of them some of them more than the others. I mean, Smyrna, they were completely economically destroyed by the emperor, and all the people were influenced by the emperor of Rome and casting out anybody who was professed to be Christians, threw them out onto the street, as, as sort of their punishment. Destroyed all the things where their house was not livable, and they were not able to enter into the house, so they were out there starving. And right. there was the other other ones, whether you know they were the they were the dumping ground or they were the the first place to be destroyed if war were to happen in those seven in the in this pathway of everything. I mean, you're right. There's a lot of economical hardship it, that it was many thi of them face. It was Thyatira where they had the trade guilds. Yeah. Where if you did not engage in paganism down to worshiping the emperor, you were thrown out of the trade guild. Right. And you could not do business there. And that verse in Revelation, I think depicts that where if you don't if you don't bow the knee you're going to be you you're likely going to lose your livelihood and so for those who loved money like the laodiceans well what are you going to choose are you going to choose money or are you going to choose faith and they were choosing money all right so that number 666 i've always heard people talk about well, it's the number of imperfection, that it's not seven, it's never seven, and that perhaps that's true. And what, what I wanted to suggest is, and I don't want to suggest this, this is the, a fact that the number does appear elsewhere in Scripture, and where it appears is in 1 Kings chapter 10. And if, if, you're, a, if you're either a Jew familiar with your Old Testament or if you're a Gentile familiar with your Old Testament or if anyone ever showed them in Laodicea, it's like, or any of the other churches when they read the remainder of the letter that, oh, what's the number 666? That sounds familiar. 
and it's first Kings chapter 10 at verse 14, where it says the weight of gold that came to Solomon yearly was 666 talents of gold. And that's where the number appears And Solomon who started off so well, we know what ended up happening to Solomon. Whatever his heart desired, he pursued. He had riches like no one else ever had. And frankly, it got him. It got him. He yeah. turned away from the Lord. He turned yeah. away from the Lord in his pursuit of other things. And so we think about the love of money being the being the root of all kinds of evil. Laodicea, they were extremely wealthy and they were trusting in their own righteousness and their own self that they were righteous and they were trusting in their own riches. And I think that's the sign of the beast. And as Revelation says, it's the number of man. It's like, you're going to choose money or you're going to choose Jesus. You can't yeah. do both. Yeah. You just can't do both. So anyway, um, haven't heard many folks take take that view connecting the amount of gold coming into Solomon's kingdom and revelation, but the numbers are the same. And if you're in revelation, you might think, Oh, I've heard that number before anyway. So what does the Lord tell him to do back in revelation three? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see all figures they would have understood perfectly well. They needed to make the spiritual application and they were interested in buying and selling. They needed to come to the Lord's shop and buy from him, frankly. Yeah. They need to come to God and be able to take what God has given and what God is offering. Not so, not just uh, living off their own means without God. Yeah. I think, um, you know, the passage, buy the truth and sell it not. Yeah. And they were, they were buying a lot of stuff and they were able to buy a lot of stuff. But it's, you know, the best things in life you cannot buy with money. True. Right. And they needed to buy from the Lord. They needed to invest themselves in the Lord and the Lord's cause. And they were just mad. <laughs> they were just mad. Yeah. They just, yeah. They just took the mentality of, just me eh, doesn't matter yeah eh. and it's like we're not hot we're not cold we're not yeah. we're not good for much of anything other than making money yeah and it's like what's the point of the church then <laughs> you know it's like you're just it's going not, through the motions a, why, are, yeah. why are you guys even showing up on a sunday it's not a beacon of light they haven't been maintaining yeah. anything i mean there's just nothing there's been nothing good to be said at this point in time about laodicea and, past or past or present, but right. their future, but their future is not completely closed yet. Yep. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. The Lord still loves them. Yeah. But this is what love does. Love chastens. A lot of folks get that one wrong too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they they think it's unloving to try to discipline someone. Yeah. And man, yeah. Hebrews Hebrews puts that very bluntly, that if we do not endure chastening, then we are illegitimate. Yeah. And King you don't, James you don't, uses you pretty strong chasten. language. Yeah, you don't you don't you don't chasten, you don't rebuke or anything. Now the future is bleak. Yeah. You know, and, it's 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 right. the same uh, it's it's the same concept as you know, parents having to chasten or rebuke their kids. If you don't do it now, the likelihood of everything is that the future is going to be not pleasant. Yeah. It's easier to do when they're five than when they're 25. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't do it when they're five, you don't want to see 25. No. That's just the reality. So the Lord rebukes them, chastens them, encourages them to be zealous and repent. Says, and I, I think as well, look at that, you know, the idea of being hot. You yeah. need to be hot with this. That's, that's, that's the other part of what we were talking about earlier is the idea of be zealous and repent. That's, yeah. all, that's, that's how I come to that conclusion of what we were talking about earlier about the cold or hot thing. 
And I'll say, I'll say, be zealous in both things. Yeah. You, you know, and, and that's the thing. When the Lord cleansed the temple and the disciples remembered zeal for thy house is eating me up that passage. Yeah. Well, when, when the Lord, when Mary was sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to him, no, he did not have a whip in his hands. No, he was not driving the animals out of the temple. No, he was not turning over the money changers tables. Was he any less zealous as he spoke to her and her sister, Martha? It's like, no, he was still zealous. Yeah. It was just different. And that whether you're hot, whether you're, you know, whether it's compassion or condemnation, you you're zealous with both anyway regardless <laughs> regardless uh he stands at the door and knocks if anyone hears opens the door and you have this wonderful picture of fellowship i will come in and with him and dine with him and he with me and it's just this picture of fellowship yeah and, and being with the lord being with the lord being there at the throne there's another reference of you know we talk about the crown now we're talking about the throne right in this in this section here a sign of power a sign of uh, a sign of you know i want that's where i want to be you know the the high places the places where the rich would be you know that high that throne sort of thing we can yep. be there with christ at his throne and it's it's an interesting figure when he talks about talks about the throne and he talks about he talks about three persons on that throne because he says and i hadn't noticed this before as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So he's sitting with the father on his throne, right? Yes. And then he says he, that he will grant to us to sit with him on the throne. So anyway, it, it's a picture of fellowship. Yeah. But as it's displayed here, there's only one throne and the father is on it. And then Jesus is on it. And then we will be on it and we will all be together. And that's the picture yeah, of heaven. Exactly. So he who has an ear, hear what the spirit says to the churches. And we, is that in every one of the, yeah, that is yes. in every one yes. of the. Every one of them has that. You can say that for sure. And that would be correct. I like the seven verses. So everyone has, he who has an ear and every, and everyone has the, I know, doesn't it? Yeah, I know your works, yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the crazy things is people think that works has nothing to do with salvation. Yeah. And yet the Lord starts everyone with, I know your works. Yeah. How is it we can be able to say that works does not matter? You know, this. Uh, yeah. we, we get on another tangent of everything, but Jesus points out, the works of every congregation here in these right. two chapters. Paul so, does it in his letters yeah. as well. He talks about their works and what they, what some of them may need to do or some that need to maintain. It's almost like James knew what he was talking about when he said, man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Yeah. It's almost like they knew what they were talking about. It's yeah. the craziest thing. I know. <laughs> Well, that, that concludes our study of the seven churches of Asia from Revelation. I hope it's been helpful for you. Daniel, I appreciate you going through with this with me and helping us see some of these things. Yeah, I've enjoyed it as well. Appreciate your work on everything. And Yeah. I, uh, well, I, I, I'll send a shout out. I didn't do it the other day, but uh, to Jesse Flowers and his help with everything on yeah, yeah. one of our discussions as well. Appreciated that. Yep. He sat in with us when he was here in North Ridgeville doing a meeting, but I, he, you know, honestly, I've, I'd never, I've never gone through and done a series on these churches before. And so it's been very helpful for me um, just to go through and see, see these things, see some of the connections to the history and geography. It's like, Oh, that's what the Lord's talking about. Yeah. And make the spiritual application. So hope it's been beneficial to our, to our listeners and, um, as we make applications, what are we talking about next, Daniel? Uh, we're, we, uh, we're discussing, I think we're going to be looking at the Pharisees. We're going to begin looking at uh, some different kind of jumping from this because we've talked in Revelation 2 and 3 about some of the different doctrinal teachings. 
Uh, we talked about the Nicolaitans, referencing them a little bit. So we're going to begin looking at uh, some different doctrinal teachings, and we're going to begin off with the Pharisees next week. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verse 1 down to verse 9 is some of my jumping point starting off there. Because the Pharisees were supposed to be keepers of the law, but they were more keepers of tradition, and we'll be talking about that yeah. uh, here next. Okay. So we're going to be we're going to be looking at false doctrines. Yeah, and of course, as we look at false doctrines, we're also looking at true doctrine and looking to Jesus with all things. Yep, and all things. So that's where we're that's where we're going to begin. That's where we're going to be next week, I should say. Uh, so hopefully, that study will be beneficial. For folks, as we think about, and doctrine matters. A lot of folks think that works don't matter, which is also a doctrine. <laughs> and a lot of folks think that doctrine does not matter. And um, even from these letters, those who held to false doctrine, they were condemned. Yeah. Because it affects what we do. <laughs> that lo and behold, what we believe affects what we do. So right. looking forward to that next week. Appreciate you, Daniel. Appreciate everything as well. All right. Take care of yourself. Appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, appreciate our listeners and hope it's helpful for you as we strive to walk that straight and narrow path, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you. Thank you.